Ladies and gentlemen, can we please start? I would like to call uh, Professor Andrew Crush uh, to welcome us. I would also like to just uh, acknowledge uh, the TVC uh, Villagazi from uh, VETS uh, for research. Uh, can you welcome uh, Prof. Uh, Crouch, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, TC, for, for uh, welcoming me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll try to be brief because I told Gerda uh, that I'm going to listen to the lecture and then I'm going to run away. So that's why I'm sitting in that side of, of the room. But on behalf of the University of the Witwatersrand, I would like to heartily welcome you to this 65th Bernard Price Memorial Lecture. Now, we wanted to have the lecture much earlier in the year, normally around uh, uh, September, October, but I think due to some event we had this year, I don't, want to, I don't know what it is, uh, we had to postpone this lecture until a later date, and that date is in fact today. So uh, it's an honor for us to also have uh, Professor Chalitsi Marwala from uh, the University of Johannesburg as our guest or our speaker. Now, uh, I don't want to uh, enlighten you or bore you with the details of the similarities or, th or differences between Chalitsi and some of my colleagues here, but I think there's one common denominator, and I can tell you later maybe over tea what that common denominator is. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bernard Price Memorial Lecture is a very, very important lecture on, on our academic calendar. In fact, uh, I've looked around uh, and I've asked people who want to know on this lecture series, and I believe it's been running since 1951. So it's, it's a long-standing lecture series, and as I pointed out, it's a very, very important uh, lecture for uh, Wits University. So we are, in, fi in fact, very proud to host you, uh, although not on the Wits campus, but uh, it would actually have been uh, good to have you there. Dr. Bernard Price uh, is a very important benefactor of Wits University. In fact, we, I know that he is an engineer, and uh, although I'm not an engineer myself, I do have respect for, for engineers because I work with, okay, I won't mention names. <laughs> uh, but I have respect for, for engineers uh, on the whole, and in fact, the Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment at Wits University is one of the faculties that in fact uh, uh, reports to, to my office. So I have some background knowledge of, of the engineering profession, although I can't claim to be even a quasi-engineer. So Dr. Price, as I said, is a, or was a, a benefactor, and he, in fact, uh, contributed and was the founding member of the Bernard Price Institute for Paleontological Research at Wits University. And that institute still, in fact, is one of our key institutes uh, at Wits today, although it has, to a certain extent, also merged with other activities in paleontology, which we are uh, having at, at Wits. In fact, we host the National Center for Paleontology at, at uh, so you see how it has progressed with that initial investment. Uh, in fact, now we have a lot of bigger things. The memorial lecture is meant to be of scientific or engineering interest, and it's normally given by an invited guest, either from locally or uh, normally when we have these lectures, we have a healthy attendance. Uh, and again, like tonight, uh, we have a healthy attendance. So thank you very much for those of you who turned up to grace us with your presence here tonight. And I'm sure that the lecture which we're going to have today is going to be both enlightening, informative, and it will make us think about what is the next revolution, not what is the next 
evolution or what is the next protest, but what is the next revolution. So with that, those few words, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Wits University, welcome to this memorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Krausch. I would like to <clears throat> welcome uh, all uh, our guests, uh, our members, uh, our potential members. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, all our members uh, who are not with us here. Uh, we live streaming this. We've got 7,000 uh, members, and uh, I'm hoping uh, that at least 40% uh, of them are watching us now. Am I right? <laughs> um, without uh, any, any delay, uh, thank you everyone for, for being with us. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our, our guest speaker. As uh, Prof has indicated, traditionally we normally have uh, this prestigious event uh, at VETS, but for various reasons uh, we're having it here today. And uh, we felt that uh, with the guest speaker, uh, let's make sure that uh, we finish this series. We don't know what's going to happen uh, in February. So hence we're having it in December and I'm happy that uh, the attendance uh, uh, is good. And um, I'd just like to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Prof. Marala uh, was born uh, in Venda, uh, which is in South Africa, and is, current, <laughs> and is currently a, a Deputy Vice-Chancellor uh, research, internalization, and library at the uh, University of Johannesburg. Uh, Marwala was previously a dean uh, at UJ and uh, a professor uh, also at UJ. And uh, he's been a DST stroke NRF uh, South Africa Research Chair of Systems Engineering at VETS. So there is some um, uh, association with VETS, uh, Andrew. Uh, and he was also a professor at uh, UP. Um, he is the youngest recipient of the Order of Mapungbugwe, and he was the first African to be awarded the President Award for the National Research uh, Foundation of South Africa. And uh, he holds uh, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering with Magna Cum Laude from Case uh, Western Reserve uh, University in USA. And he has a Master's uh, of Engineering from uh, UP and a PhD in Engineering from University of uh, Cambridge. And he was a post-doctoral uh, research associate at Imperial College uh, in London. He has been a, a visiting uh, professor at Harvard and uh, Wolfson uh, College uh, in Cambridge. He has supervised uh, 45 masters and uh, 19 PhD students uh, to completion. Uh, I was told that uh, I must highlight this word to completion because uh, he, he can supervise 45 and, and 19 but not to completion. <laughs> and uh, he holds uh, three uh, USA uh, patents and he has published over 300 uh, technical papers and uh, including nine books. Uh, his first book was published in 2007. You must listen to this one now. He is a fellow of SAIE, which means South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, uh, TWAC, the World Academy of Science, the Academy of Science of South Africa, and he's also a senior member of uh, IEEE. And currently, he's a board member uh, at EOH is an independent and executive uh, board member and uh, previously he has served as a board member at uh, City Power and States South Africa. Can we welcome uh, Prof and uh, he will tell us. Uh, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Sunny uh, Bonan. Uh, thank you very much for finally organizing this uh, Bernard Price Memorial Lecture. 
The first time I was supposed to speak, I kept on talking to one of the deputy vice chancellors at uh, at Vets uh, Tower, and I was saying that, uh, is it safe for me to come and speak? He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to be preparing your slides, and uh, and then obviously we had to cancel this uh, uh, this this lecture. But um, there is a saying that says, uh, it's uh, better late than never. So I am going to come and talk to you today about a subject that I have been thinking about for quite a while, the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, and society. I will, um, you know, hopefully uh, try to, to tell you some of my opinions as to what uh, artificial intelligence is. Um, I will talk about uh, an aspect of artificial intelligence called uh, optimization, and then I will go on to applications, and then I will talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, in fact, I will go through all the four industrial revolutions uh, leading to the fourth one, and then I will conclude this talk. This is a video uh, from a university that I visited last, last year. It's, it's called KAIST, uh, Korean Institute of Advanced Study. So this is uh, basically uh, a robot that actually drives itself. You saw, it's, uh, you saw uh, it uh, it's driving the car. Um, it is uh, moving. It's not controlled. It's not remote controlled. It's actually doing it independent of, of its human owner. It even opens a door. Get inside. Tries uh, its bit as an engineer. It's thinking a little bit. This is fast forward because it's slower than, than this. Uh, thinks and then it decides to do something else. Uh, then there are four uh, drills. And it uh, catches one. For some mysterious reason, it, uh, it pushes another one. Uh, <laughs> then it, it grabs. And then it drills. All are attributes that uh, are normally in the domain of human beings. So you basically have here a machine that is trying to do what we call general intelligence, because we, we have been quite good at uh, training machines to do specific tasks. But these are multiple tasks that, uh, that it is doing. Now what can we learn from this robot? Uh, clearly it, it learns. Just like human being, it is able to learn. It senses its environment. That is why it was not colliding with, uh, with walls. It reacts. Well, you can say it sees, you know, because uh, seeing is basically uh, perceiving your, visually perceiving your environment. And you can, it can do this quite easily because it has a camera mounted on it. It, it was driving a car. It walks. It adapts, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when it climbs a stair, it walks, but when it is uh, 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 traveling on a flat floor, it actually drives. It's almost human, and we will say it is artificially intelligent, but does it commit a crime? Does it fall in love? And more importantly, is it conscious? Because consciousness is one of the most controversial subjects that we hardly understand. Well, I'm reminded of uh, an ancient uh, 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 saying by an anonymous person which says that nature is the best teacher. Learn from it. This is really what artificial intelligence is all about. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial, man-made, Intelligence, the ability to basically make sense of information beyond the obvious. Uh, basically, uh, it is about uh, 
creating machines that are able to, to do sophisticated tasks that are at least uh, in the domain of human capability. It is concerned with modeling complex systems with computational tools, and uh, very often the algorithms are developed to mimic physiological systems such as human brain in order to carry out uh, complicated tasks. And mathematics is obviously quite crucial in, in, in developing artificial intelligence tools. And then uh, there is a, a test that was done by Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing was a, a famous computer science mathemati stroke mathematician, British mathematician, who is probably more known for breaking the German code. I think there was a movie about him not too long ago. He says, this, this is called a Turing test. A machine is intelligent if when humans interact with it, they are not sure whether they are interacting with a machine or a human being. That is what is called the Turing test. For example, many of us, when we go on holidays, we have an automatic uh, reply system. So if I interact with it once, I, I write an email to you, it comes back and say, I'm not available right now, please contact me later. You probably will not know whether that message came from uh, a machine or it came from a human being. But if you write back and say, uh, at what time should I contact you? You probably will return the same message that you returned. <laughs> then you will know. <laughs> then you will know that, no, this is actually a machine. You know? So there has to be a, an element of repeated interaction. Because you, you can always make a machine that almost fools you if you interact it with, one, with it once. Uh, so far, there's not really been anything that... Um, has broken the Turing test. I keep on reading of, uh, of, of people claiming to have broken the Turing test. There are two types of intelligence, individual versus group intelligence. I will talk about uh, them much more in detail. Individual intelligence, uh, you can think of it as intelligence emanating from a single brain. A brain we know is a system which is quite complicated. But um, as a system, uh, a single brain, we'll call it individual intelligence. Whether well, group intelligence is multiple brains, whether it's a group of pigeons uh, trying to do a, 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 a certain task, or a group of lions that are trying to attack a zebra, that will be a group intelligence. So simply, uh, on the left-hand side, that will be um, uh, uh, individual intelligence. Whereas on the, on the right-hand side, on that fish tank, it's actually a school of fish that is operating as a system. But each fish probably has its own brain. Now, one aspect of artificial intelligence is what we call learning. How do we make machines actually learn? And there are many techniques that have been developed to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about one that is called artificial neural networks. So on the left-hand side, you have... Uh, a set of inputs that are being propagated into outputs. The, in, the, the, the inputs might actually be uh, the price of stock uh, today, and the, uh, today and the last three days, and the output will be a price of stock tomorrow. This will be a predictive system that is able to help you predict the future stock or uh, 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 price of stock. Uh, and, 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 and this is how a neural network is actually looks like in the middle is a much more clearer diagram. Uh, this will be supervised learning. It has set, sets of inputs that are being propagated into output. Where you see errors, that is what we call neurons. And neurons were, 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 were actually uh, inspired by the, the, the biological neurons that we observe uh, in, 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 in biological animals. So uh, once you have multiple layers, this is a neural network, exactly as I said. The, the, the neural network that I showed you there had only one single layer. This has multiple layers. You have hidden layer one, you have hidden layer two, you have hidden layer three. This is what they call a deep neural network. You know, it's a big term now. Uh, uh, Deep neural network is, is nothing but a sophisticated 
uh, neural network inter, uh, uh, architecture with many layers, and because of this, it is able to learn very complex uh, uh, things like pictures uh, uh, and so on. Now, how do we make neural network learn? I think this is quite important. So if you have examples of your inputs and you have examples of your outputs, uh, this neural network says what something that we call weight. In statistics, these are free parameters. This is what statisticians call free parameters. So what you do when you train a neural network, you basically identify those weights such that your ability to make an accurate prediction whenever you are given a set of inputs is maximized. And once you start talking about maximization, uh, in mathematical terms we call that optimization. So the mathematical framework that actually enables us to be able to make neural network uh, learn is basically optimization. Now optimization is, uh, is a process of identifying either a maximum or a minimum point. For example, uh, if you wanted to move from here to Senten City, there will be an optimal path, which is, which is the shortest distance from here to, 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 to the given the constraints, which is the fact that you can't go there on, on a straight line if you're driving a car. So that will be an optimum point. And to be able to identify that optimum point, we will call that process uh, um, optimization. And optimization um, originated uh, mainly in mathematics through uh, calculus. Uh, in fact, uh, Newton was the first person to formulate an optimization problem, uh, the newton raphson method. Um, but uh, we can learn quite a great deal from nature on how to do this optimization, especially for problems that are not easily mathematically codified, like, for example, distances between, between uh, um, you know, uh, two, two points might not necessarily be easily mathematically quantified. And as a result, you have an optimization technique called ant colony optimization. In fact, uh, this um, ant colony optimization came out of, uh, of, 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 of a theory that was proposed by a South African person called Eugene Marey. Eugene Marey uh, wrote a book called The Sylph and the Mir, which was really the first, the first uh, work on, 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 on understanding how, how ants actually do what they do. For example, this pic the picture at the top was the picture that I took when I was, uh, uh, when I was in Venda, TC, in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, the picture. That, but uh, these ants at the bottom are actually what makes that complicated structure. So uh, uh, Eugene Marie, I don't know which part of South Africa he was from, I, I, but I would guess he's from Limpopo. Uh, <laughs> witnessed quite a great deal of this and came up with, uh, with uh, the, the theory of some intelligence. And for example, uh, for those of you who have uh, interacted with ants, you will see that in your houses you will see almost a straight line of ants from one point to another. And the way they work there is each one of them deposits pheromones. And um, you know, uh, uh, it just follows uh, the direction in which the pheromones are stronger. And after a while, they actually identify a shortest distance from their home, to, to, from their nest, to, their, to, to the food source, an optimization problem. And this you can codify mathematically and algorithmically. And this has been used quite extensively in scheduling problems, for example. Um, the other one is um, um, particle swarm optimization. You can see uh, uh, we don't have too many pigeons in South Africa anymore. I, I think you probably will have to go to Trafalgar Square in London to see something like this. But they seem to be following that uh, gentleman who is giving them seeds. Now, how do they do that? You know, uh, 
the, mechan of, uh, the mechanism that they use is actually quite simple. Uh, you have local best, which is individual intelligence. Each one of them has its own perspective of where the food source is. And then uh, group intelligence, which is a group. What is the group doing? So the interplay between what it knows and what the group knows is basically what ends up making each pigeon actually find where the food source is. And this is another example of an optimization problem. And this has been used to optimize problems such as in, in designing power lines and so on and so forth. And the one, uh, the picture that I, I borrowed, which is a bit uh, still, uh, I don't know, it's almost 200 years after this theory was proposed. It's still as controversial as it was when it was proposed. Uh, this is uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. And from this theory, we are able to come up with uh, what we call genetic algorithm, another optimization technique. As you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's just a simple genetic algorithm that is trying to replicate uh, uh, the picture on, on your right hand side. If, if you allow it to go on, it actually replicates it fairly well. You know? uh, and again, um, uh, 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 this algorithm uses mechanism of, of evolution uh, crossover, which is mixing of genes, um, mutation, which is just uh, changing genes a little bit, and reproduction. And again, we are able to, to use genetic algorithm to design quite a great deal of things. So we're still on the same page. Thank you very much. So I think now uh, we, are, we have some idea of what learning is all about. We talked about neural network and how it learns. Uh, we, know, we talked about um, uh, optimization, uh, three optimization techniques we talked about. Now, how do we apply this? You know, when, we, when I think of application, I remember what I was once told, that knowledge only becomes education when it is used for the benefit of society. So it is all well and good to, to learn how all these things work but it's even better if we can be able to put it to practical use. The first example that uh, um, I, will, I will use to illustrate what AI is capable of doing, uh, because I think we need to understand um, what AI is capable of doing in order for us to start engaging on what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. Uh, this is a project that actually I did uh, when I was still based in Bramfontein before I moved to Oakland Park uh, with, uh, uh, with my students. And this is, um, this is uh, uh, basically a, a program that we designed to do what is called a tri triage mechanism. A triage mechanism is used in hospitals, but it started in the army. So if you are a doctor in, an, uh, in a war zone and you have um, four people injured, how do you schedule who is helped first, and then who is helped second, who is helped uh, third, and who, who is helped fourth? That arrangement is called triage. So you, whatever criteria you might decide, if it is in a war zone, you probably want to save. Obviously, the first criteria is somebody that uh, can be saved the fastest. Because if you can save uh, that person the fastest, you probably can go to the second person. You know. So if the second person, they have to go on in a two-hour operation and the, the other person is only a, you know, a 10 minutes, you probably will have to do the, the 10 minutes. And other criteria. In a war situation, they even use criteria such as who is likely going to recover and go and fight the next day. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, this is what we have done. And then uh, genetic algorithm is there. Uh, which is um, where we, uh, we apply it to, to basically prioritize who, who is assisted first or not. And this is actually quite powerful because uh, this was something that is, used to be done by human beings, and uh, they never actually used to do it quite right you know, uh, because of all sorts of limitations of human beings. And once you codify it in a machine, then it is quite uh, useful. And this is reinforcement uh, uh, learning. Uh, reinforcement learning is, uh, 
is, uh, I think it originates from psychology. Uh, it's, it's, it's a neural network. You can think of it as a neural network that is able to learn case by case. So you don't give it a, a batch of data. You give it one data and then it learns. If it learns well, it is rewarded. If it, it learns badly, it is, it is punished. And, and after a while, it becomes good at it, what it, what it does. And this actually worked quite well. Uh, this is another work that I, that, 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 that I did with, um, with uh, one of our students. It's, uh, it's an aerial photograph, and all you had to do was, you, you just want to classify each, 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 each part as to, and these are the classification, whether it is water, whether it is, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, 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 you know, uh, drought, drought uh, place, and, and where it can be able to classify. And you can imagine if you had to, a person had to do it visually, it's very, uh, it's very painful and takes quite a great deal of time. And we were able to, to use uh, another type of a learning mechanism called support vector machines, which is mainly based on, on statistical mechanics, uh, to basically classify this. So what we do uh, is... Uh, we take uh, this into, into a domain and then we just increase the dimension of the data until we, it can be linearly separated. And it works quite well. And then the work that uh, we also did here with, um, with uh, AK, Mr. A.K. Uh, Mohammed and, um, and um, Professor John was we were trying to see whether it is possible to map what is happening? How do I go back? You see, when things are done by human beings, they make mistakes. <laughs> if somebody can come in. Okay. But the good thing is that human beings are adaptable, so they are able to correct their mistake quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works. The system works. Now, uh, uh, so if you, this is uh, an EEG, ECG, EEG. David, is it an EEG e e or ECG? EEG. Yeah, EEG signal, which you put in your head, and it basically, you know, uh, uh, measures activities in your brain, and you move your, 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 your arm, and you see whether you can be able to identify uh, what area of, of the brain is actually activated. And the general idea is, you know, uh, 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 is for the future when somebody loses the hand, or not even loses the hand, is probably part of a, of, of a robot, and uh, uh, it is uh, going to some hazardous environment. So you want to control it you know, while you are sitting in, 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 in a safe place. So when you, when you do this, it does that. But here we're trying to, to see whether we can be able to do it by controlling the, the, the mind. Um, uh, the concept of mind over matter is quite controversial in the scientific uh, community. But we were able to, to, to see that uh, movement of, of certain gestures actually map very well to activities in the brain. And in the future, we should be able to use, to train people uh, to control their brain, to be able to, 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 to move prosthesis, uh, arms, and so on and so forth. Then there's... This is the work that I did with David. You still remember David, at the work of uh, Mr. Nadim Mohammed. Uh, this is uh, what is called, um, this is also from an ECG uh, 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 machine. So doctors basically look at this and they have to make a diagnosis with regards to epilepsy. Of course, uh, what we are doing here is to, to segment data, you put, you extract features, you put it into a neural network. Uh, we actually use the neural network to do this, and then it is able to make a, diagnos a diagnosis. It is actually fairly accurate. And this should not be, 
taken for granted, taking something that is being done by a doctor and then you put it in, 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 into a computer and it comes up with a very accurate uh, environment. In fact, uh, somebody did a study of radio, uh, radiologists. Uh, I think it was 100 radiologists who were given, who were given about 1,000 uh, images and then they made their diagnosis and then uh, the information was locked. And after two weeks, and these apparently were some of the best uh, in the field, after two weeks, the same information was presented to the same group of people. Apparently, they changed their minds 50% of their time. And the same thing if was done on a, an artificially intelligent uh, machine and it did not change his mind at all. So consistency. Well, of course, consistency is not the goal. The goal is accuracy. But it turns out that uh, the machines were actually quite accurate. And you can imagine, and, 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 and you have human beings making all these decisions, but a human being is impacted by the environment much, much more dynamically than, than a machine. So, it is important that whatever we can be able to automate, let us automate. And this is another work that we did on internet, uh, uh, in a prediction of internet uh, instability. Looking back, this is code red in 2001. And here we're using uh, what is called an autoencoder. An autoencoder auto is basically a neural network that you train to be able to predict what it has been able to, what it has seen. Sounds a little bit uh, awkward that you want something to tell you what you have given it. But it is doing this through some nonlinear transformation. And this is very, very important because it can be used as a, a novelty detection. For example, if what it has seen changes, you are able to detect that uh, this is not what it has seen before because it now starts to fail to reproduce what it has seen. So this is called an autoencoder. And, and this actually worked quite well. Um, and this work I did with uh, Megan Russell and, and, uh, and David Rubin. As you can see, we, are, we have a US patent uh, uh, here. Uh, and this was on uh, MIT Technology Review, isn't it? Uh, and basically this is, uh, we are mapping the movement of a tongue to what the person is saying. So if somebody loses the, the ability to the larynx, uh, and then, but still has a tongue, uh, so they can be able to, to say what they used to say. The voice is not going to come out. But just by looking at uh, the movement of the tongue, you are able to recreate what the person was supposed to say. I think uh, here they call it, uh, the MIT Technology Review, they call it a robot voice. And then uh, the recognition of faces. Uh, this is the work that uh, I did with uh, uh, Mr. Surajpal. And again, uh, the architecture is the same. You, 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 you take a picture, you make it into, into some form of features, that goes into some classifier, which is a neural network, and is able to identify who the, who the person is. So, uh, and then the other thing that it does is able to estimate missing data. This is a book that we, we wrote uh, on, on how you can be able to use artificial intelligence to, to basically uh, uh, pre uh, uh, predict missing information. Again, uh, we use an autoencoder, which is able to, to re replicate what it has seen. And if one of the variable is missing, you basically search for the variable that is missing until it is able to reproduce everything that it has seen. Um, and this is another uh, area that uh, I have become very interested in, uh, the concept of making rational decisions. I think when somebody is asked one question today and in two weeks' time and they give two different answers, I don't think that is rational. 
I think is actually irrational. And we, we have spent quite a great deal of, 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 of time trying to understand what causality is. Because causality is not correlation. And much of what is detected, one of the, of course, uh, within causality, there is correlation. It's a, you know, uh, for, for two things to cause one another, there has to be, uh, you know, if you observe them, there has to be uh, some correlation. But that is not sufficient. And the only way you can be able to detect causality, I think they call it the transmission theory of, of causality, is there has to be a flow of information from the cause to the effect. And when you are detecting causality, you are basically detecting that uh, uh, flow of information from the cause to, to, to the effect. And you can, uh, these books are all on Amazon and I encourage you to buy them. <laughs> So this is the work that we did with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Evan Hewitt. And in fact, it, it made it to, to the front page of New Scientist, where we, we actually proved to, we, we were able to demonstrate that a computer can actually, on its own, learn how to bluff. And I'm not bluffing. <laughs> and as you can see here, uh, Hewitt and Chilidzi, uh, maybe you just forget the Witwatersrand Red Party because uh, the two gentlemen now are at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, but uh, again, these are other things that we normally uh, see uh, 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 human beings doing, uh, and the computer can be able to do this. My grandmother always told me that every object has something to say. We should learn to listen and interpret its, its message. My grandmother used to make clay pots. So, and making clay pots in a village in Limpopo uh, is not as uh, simple as we think it is. You know, she will, she will do a very a, a nice shape, and after that she has to put it on a fan. In fact, it first goes to the, to, uh, to the sun so that it can dry, because uh, if you take it to the furnace directly, it is going to, to crack. And then after that you take it to the furnace, it's almost, you can even see it is, it is, it is red. Uh, uh, and then after that, she will knock it and listen to it. And she say, my grandson, this is a good one. And so on and so forth. But she was doing that by listening to what it has to say. And uh, now we can do the same thing. Obviously, instead of using um, uh, 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 an ear, as my grandmother used to do, you can basically use sophisticated, uh, you know, accelerometers and so on and so forth. And you are able to, then to be able to tell whether a structure is good or bad or the structure is about to crack or not crack and so on and so forth. And this is important. Uh, this is a picture of a bridge in Senten. Uh, you all remember when this bridge uh, 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 collapsed. Of course, if you had wires, if you had signals coming out of that bridge, you, you, you would definitely would have been able to predict it before it actually existed. Of course, there are the economic part of this. You know. So this is another work that we, we, we spend a lot of time doing. Uh, AI can monitor the condition of structures. And we actually wrote a book uh, published by, by Springer on, 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 on this work, um, uh, both in mechanical and electrical systems, uh, and so on and so forth. And then the other work that we have done is this is a finite element model. Uh, why do we need a finite element model? We need a finite element model so that we can design better cars or any other structure. And to design it on a computer is better than designing it physically because you can test all sorts of properties, you know, how, you know, how uh, thickness here and so on and so forth. Uh, instead of building it, you can just do it on a computer. But unfortunately, what you get on a computer is not necessarily what you measure in reality. So the whole discipline of making finite element models better predict or reflect reality is what is called finite element updating. And uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, uh, working on uh, how uh, we can use computational intelligence tools because ultimately it's, a, it's an optimization uh, problem. Because at the end of the day, you are basically identifying the set of parameters that you are not sure about such that the distance between the prediction of your model 
and your measurements are minimized. And you can also, uh, uh, and, and one of the problems that you, you, you encounter when you use standard optimization techniques is that you have multiple solutions and each solution is not necessarily the correct one. And because of that, you can use Bayesian statistics, which is another book that uh, I wrote with uh, Elias. Elias, are you here? Uh, Elias uh, is, from, is from the northern part of, uh, is from Algeria, and we, we, we co-wrote uh, a, a book together uh, on, on how we are able to do this. And then uh, uh, another work that we have been working on is how do we use artificial intelligence to basically understand the economy, uh, to predict the stock market. I remember one of my students coming to me and saying that, yes, I have come up with an algorithm that is able to predict the stock market. But unfortunately, it predicts one day late. <laughs> I said, no. But that is a lookup table, you know. <laughs> Uh, that was Gareth Sita who came to tell me that. But we, we, have, we have spent a lot of time doing uh, 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 this work uh, on, on, on uh, how to use uh, artificial intelligence to understand the economy. How to, and this is the work that I did with Monica Lagazio from Italy on how do you, to use artificial intelligence to, to um, predict interstate conflict. This has now been uh, uh, translated into a, ch a Chinese Mandarin by the Chinese uh, defense industry press, you know, <laughs> and there were fixed copies that, uh, that were published and uh, that were printed, uh, and, and it was quite exciting, uh, especially the royalties. Uh, and then the other work that we have actually been working on now is, you know, economic theory has been crafted under the assumption that the principal agent in the decision-making process is a human being. Now, more than ever before, much of the decision-making are actually being made by machines. Now, if that is the case, what happens to the whole concept of economic theory, whether it is uh, the principle of demand and supply, whether it is the principle of rational expectation or theory of rational choice, and so on and so forth. So we have been quite preoccupied on doing that. And one of the, the theories that uh, was proposed by, by Stiglitz uh, was uh, the theory of, in fact, he won a Nobel Prize for this, uh, of information asymmetry. What he basically said was that uh, information asymmetry means, you know, if I'm the customer, I don't know about the product that somebody is selling than the person who is selling it. And they use the concept of a used car salesman where one person is selling good cars, another one is selling bad cars, but you don't know which one is which. That because the person who is selling bad cars is probably more willing to offer a discount than the person who is selling good cars, it actually drives the person who is selling good cars out of the market. And as a result, in, uh, 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 as a result, information asymmetry distorts the market. That is the information, of, uh, 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 information asymmetry. Now, what happens when we remove human beings in that transaction? And it is an artificially intelligent buyer who can go and search into the internet. What we found, and this is actually uh, 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 being taught at Cornell University, and I, I, I got this from their lecture notes, uh, and you can see we were being quoted. They were saying that uh, we discovered that artificial intelligence can greatly reduce the degree of information asymmetry. Yeah, quite straightforward, because now it's not a human being, you know, and they can be able to search much more. But we also found that it is able to enhance efficiency of trades, but it decreases the volume of trades which is a little bit counterintuitive. Why does it decrease the volume of trades? The reason is because you buy something because of information asymmetry. If you have a thousand rands and you want to buy, I don't know, a phone, the person will only sell you if he thinks your 1,000 rand is worth more than the phone. And you will buy it because you think that the phone is worth 
more than you know, 1,000. <laughs> so when you reduce that degree of information asymmetry, you actually reduce the, 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 the volume of trade. And this is, uh, uh, I picked up on, uh, on a German website where they were talking about uh, the concept of information asymmetry and the theory of efficient market hypothesis. Uh, what, it, what it is basically saying here, it is saying that, uh, uh, yeah, for those who read German, you probably can see what, <laughs> what it says. It says that artificial intelligent traders make markets more efficient. And it has all sorts of implications on behavioral economics, which is based on the fact that uh, uh, the principal agent is actually a human being. And in fact, there are lots of interesting uh, uh, studies that you can do uh, as to how, how, how all this actually mixed together. Now, uh, we now understand that artificial intelligence can actually do a lot of things that we do. How does it link to the fourth industrial revolution? Before I talk about that, I will just talk about the industrial revolution and, 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 and the respective DNA. The first industrial revolution happened in 1784, mysteriously in some island, uh, not even in mainland Europe. It's actually quite extraordinary, because uh, statistically it should have happened in, certainly in India, because that is where the population density was the highest. And perhaps China, China is geographically bigger, uh, and so on and so forth. But it happened in, in this, uh, in this unknown island, uh, 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 and, and why did it happen there? Of course, it gave us steam engines, trains, mechanical uh, 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 machines for production. I think its DNA was Newton's laws of motion, because from that moment, we were able to predict how things are going to move. And if we're able to do that, then we can be able to design things. Of course, uh, of course, it's, it's, it was just not the DNA was actually the Newton's law of motion. That's, what, that's my thinking. The second industrial revolution, uh, which gave us assembly line electricity, uh, I think its DNA was electromagnetism, especially Faraday and, and Maxwell, very, very key. Because, of course, you all know that uh, when you put a, 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 a conductor next to a magnet and you move the conductor, you get electricity. Very important, if you put electricity through a conductor, it moves. And because of that, you get an elect electric motor. And the electric motor gave you the assembly line. So that was the DNA of, 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 of the second industrial revolution. Without these two gentlemen, of course somebody else, it would have been somebody else, maybe Vilakazi and... and, and <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but that was... Uh, of course we do know that electromagnetism was actually what led to Einstein's theory of relativity, you know, to basically uh, map uh, Maxwell's equations with... Uh, with, Newton, with Newtonian mechanics. And then the third industrial revolution was obviously a transistor, you know. That is not, you know, when, you, when we're in primary school, they say something conducts electricity or it does not conduct electricity. When you were able to find material which conducts electricity under certain conditions, then you were on your way to getting a transistor. That was the third industrial revolution. Now, the fourth industrial revolution, I think artificial intelligence is the DNA. I might be biased, but that is, that is actually uh, 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 what everybody is, is saying. And from, 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 from now henceforth, information becomes a huge currency. Uh, issues such as big data, uh, cyber security, and so on and so forth. And I think the DNA was basically Alan Turing's ideas, you know, of of, of, of man and machine, you know. In, in, the, in the 50s, it took a long time to take off, but I think, uh, and this is very important for us that, you know, little things, oh, okay, these were big things, you know, uh, have huge impact 
on the evolution of, of, of history. And what are we going to see in this fourth industrial revolution? We are going to see reduction in the participation of people in the world of work. Bill Gates says that almost 80% of the jobs that exist today will not exist in 50 years' time. And he says quite a great deal of what do we do for us as educators in order to, you know, to, to prepare young people for, for this era. Well, there is a Japanese proverb. It sounds very modern uh, proverb, but it's quite instructive. It is inhumane to expect that which can be done by a machine to be done by a human being. So automation is not the enemy. You know, uh, uh, we just have to find ways of uh, And these are the sort of skills that uh, we are actually training people for in 2015. And these are the skills. These are, uh, this is according to the World Economic Forum. You can see in 2020. Now in 2050, or preparing, preparing people to live in this fourth industrial revolution, what do we do? I think critical thinking skills are key. I think, uh, you know, skills that require uh, uh, human interaction are key. For example, if you are going to go to a doctor to find the outcome of some, you know, some investigation that was done, uh, you probably would be at ease uh, interacting with a human being than a machine, isn't it, Tina? Because uh, there are uh, empathy, for example, we can't be able to build robots that, uh, that can be able to show emotions. We can try, but uh, uh, then emotional intelligence, uh, judgment, very, very important. Many of the decision making that are mechanical, they are going to be to more and more be made by machines. But I think uh, there's still an element of judgment that makes a human being such a crucial person. You know, when people are you know, fighting, you know, the person can be able to look at the expression in their faces and be able to diffuse the situation much, much better than a machine. Um, negotiation and cognitive, um, uh, cognitive capabilities. Aristotle actually foretold this era that we are living in. He said, the end of labor is to gain leisure. I think that is quite instructive for us. Now, what is the implication of, of, of the fourth industrial revolution for us on education? Um, I think the bricks and mortar are going to become less important. I can see people shaking their, their, their heads already. Uh, uh, because online blended learning enabled by uh, natural language processing will become very, very key. The transportation, I mean, it's already, it's already here. Uh, automated cars, trucks, buses, airplanes, you know, uh, most of the airplanes now, or most of the, uh, the pilots in airplanes are just spectators rather than active participants in, in, in the movement. Of. The cost of goods will drop significantly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, robots do not have, uh, do not come together and form a cosato. <laughs> And you don't feel bad when you make them work for 24 hours. Uh, I think the structure of economy will change drastically. Those with means to acquire all these machines that they're going to use for production will become wealthier and wealthier. Uh, and we'll have to rethink on how we're going to deal with that. Of course, new types of jobs are going to emerge. I think uh, safety and security uh, I mean, not too long ago, I heard that uh, there was uh, a standoff in Texas, and they used a robot to actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, not diffuse the situation because uh, there were casual casualties uh, there. But uh, but certainly, the robotic uh, um, cops in medical health, medical devices, automated diagnosis. I, I just spent a, a, a time with uh, Samsung in in. in in uh, South Korea. I mean, they are putting sensors in all sorts of places that I never thought of, in belts, you know, where they are measuring all sorts of vital characteristics and sending the information to a doctor and so on, in watches, you know. Uh, uh, 
you know, in, in, in wearable clothes and so on and so forth, you know. So uh, it will obviously uh, revolutionize that aspect of life. Uh, I, I don't have a, a, a sound here, but uh, this is from iRobot, when they were arguing about uh, uh, whether robots can kill or not. Now, what are the implications of, of all this, especially on the ethical side? How do we ensure that machines do not harm humans? What ethical framework will guide the decision making of an intelligent machine? For example, faced with an accident, which life should a self-driving car save? That of the passenger, owner of the car, or that of the group of pedestrians, if you have to choose one, if, 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 if a car can be able to make such a decision? You know. uh, how does a machine avoid statistical bias, which could have dire consequences? Uh, for example, AI in mortgage applications, which is actually quite used now. I think uh, the modality of machines is something that we need to also start thinking about. The ability to act in a manner that is considerable towards humans and possibly other machines. There was a British uh, philosopher who came up with the theory of, uh, of the maximizer. They call it uh, 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 greatest happiness to the greatest number of, of, of people. Utilitarianism. Is that the, 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 the theory that we need to use in order to embed in our machines? Uh, if we are using utilitarianism, this will be a very easy answer to solve. Because you have one person in the car, you have a group of pedestrians. It's clear that they, you know, if, 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 if one has to go, it will have to be a passenger. <laughs> but that is utilitarianism, because you are going to result with the greatest amount of happiness of seven people here, as opposed to a happiness of one person. So those are some of the things that we will need to think about and I think uh, this is uh, the problem that we actually... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I would like to call uh, Viv, uh, our past president, uh, to say the vote of thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 65th BP lecture. And if you do the arithmetic on the list in your programs, you'll find that we haven't missed a year yet. Almost, <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> now, the BP lectures, if you look at the subjects, in fact, have tracked key technologies and new science. And in fact, have often behaved as a precursor to promised and actual breakthroughs. This evening is no different. What we've heard is that we are on the cusp of a promised new age, and that this cusp, or this revolution, or this promised new age is going to revolutionize society and change our lives and our children's lives. Now, the thing about this is that with this change, we have heard that there are going to be challenges. On the one hand, people are going to be replaced executing mundane tasks. And I was really intrigued to find out that 70% of current work will not exist in 50 years. I'm waiting for that time. <laughs> On the other hand, the same technology and the same science is now going to help us with education so that we we will end up with a more, much, much more educated society. So let's see, you've now joined a list of esteemed speakers, of BP lecturers, and I wish to congratulate you on that. Thank you for your time, thank you for your insight, thank you for your lecture this evening.
And if I could ask you just to come forward and accept a small token of our gratitude. Thank, thank, thank you, Viv. Uh, I need to adjust this. <laughs> uh, th 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 thank you, Viv. Um, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, and, and, and your, your, your family. Uh, I was watching uh, who's taking the present. Uh, I can see uh, Prof Junior is taking the present. Uh. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, who has attended uh, this uh, 65th uh, PP lecture. And thank you very much. Uh, I invite you now to join us uh, for refreshment. Thank you. Thank you. 